Fact number two, that there is no icon veneration taught in the pre-Nicene church. I want to, to read some of the quotes from a few early Christians about this topic actually in the next episode. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about how Orthodox and Catholic apologists try to deal with what the early Christians said about images. From what I've seen, at least, they tend to basically say that these things the early Christians said were said in a different context, that they're not speaking against venerating an image in the context of the Christian spiritual life, but they're speaking against actually worshiping the image itself and against the worship of a false god or of paying honor to some pagan god or philosopher. And yes, that's true. It, it is a different context. But in my opinion, that's not that doesn't really deal with what the early Christians had to say about this. So here are two things to consider. First, in the next episode, you'll hear, you'll hear some of what the early Christians said. And just listen to some of these quotes and ask yourself, would an Orthodox or a Catholic Christian say some of these things in any context? Could they say some of these things in any context without contradicting the teaching of their church and without making other Orthodox and Catholic Christians really uncomfortable? Or to put it differently, can you imagine an Orthodox Christian saying some of the things the early Christians said in order to combat the pagan use of images? Or would the Orthodox Christian want to be far more careful in what they say and, and, and much more careful to make the distinction between pagan veneration of images and appropriate Christian veneration of images. I'll come back to that, but keep that in the back of your mind. And second, just because these early Christian quotes are in a different context, the context of pagan worship rather than Christian worship, does not mean that they're irrelevant to the issue of the Catholic and Orthodox practice of icon veneration. Yes, the veneration of Christian saints is technically different from the veneration of pagan gods or Greek philosophers. But the question is not whether there is technically a difference between bowing before a picture of Plato or bowing before a picture of Mary. But the question is, where did this practice come from? Is this an apostolic practice or is this a pagan practice? that was at some point adapted to a Christian context. And that, that kind of thing has happened. That's a problem in much of the Protestant church. For example, the Stoics and the Gnostics taught a form of determinism and arbitrary predestination, and it sounded a lot like what many Calvinists believe today. And there's very compelling evidence and good reasons to think that Stoic and Gnostic teachings about these things came into the church through Augustine, who had previously been a Manichaean Gnostic. And then Luther and Calvin later recovered Augustine's teachings and spread his ideas unaware of, their, of, of where they actually came from. And now hundreds of millions of Christians in the Protestant church think that God meticulously controls everything that happens and that he arbitrarily decides who is saved and who is damned apart from any choice on our part. And Calvinists today who want to defend their doctrine, for example, James White, who is a very well-known uh, Calvinist, they say, well, hold on. Stoicism and Gnosticism are totally different contexts than the Christian theology and soteriology that Augustine taught and that we believe. Stoics had a totally different worldview. Augustine had a Christian worldview. And look, he's just teaching what's right there in Romans chapter 9. He's teaching the Bible. It's not the same context. So you can't make this connection and say that Augustine was teaching 
some Gnostic idea. It's different. Well, yes, there's technically a difference between Stoic and Gnostic determinism and Augustine's determinism. And yes, Augustine believed in the true God. He wasn't a Stoic. He didn't believe what the Gnostics believed about God and Jesus. But the question is, where did his teachings come from? What influenced Augustine? Was his determinism an apostolic teaching, in which case we should see the earlier Christians before Augustine teaching it also, which we don't, or was it a Stoic and Gnostic teaching that Augustine, perhaps without realizing it, dressed up in Christian language so that it was adapted to a Christian context? That's something like what I think happened in the case of iconography, that it was a pagan practice that was adapted to a Christian context. And that's what we should expect to happen. Because, of course, when corruption comes into the church, it's not going to be this obvious thing. It's going to be more subtle. It's going to be in disguise. Of course, Christians are not going to bow before a statue of Socrates or Zeus. No, in order for a false teaching or a pagan practice to get smuggled into the church, it needs to be dressed up in Christian theological terms and biblical vernacular. That's how you can get it in. And so it morphs to fit a new context so that it can fly under the radar more easily. And then once it's embraced and ingrained in people's minds, once it's thought of as a really important doctrine or maybe even an essential doctrine, good luck getting people to think critically about it. Good luck getting a Calvinist who's been listening to and teaching Augustine's determinism to open up to the possibility that something's wrong with it or that it's a Gnostic corruption. And in the same way, good luck getting Catholics and Orthodox Christians to open up their minds to the possibility that they have been infiltrated in a similar way. No, that, that, that couldn't happen to us. Not, that, that's not possible. Our church is the one true church. No, it can and has happened all over professing Christianity. False teachings and, and doctrines have have come in and some really bad ideas have have come in from, from other other places and been adapted to a Christian context and, and now a lot of us think that they're Christian ideas. And so anyway, I hope you'll uh, you'll at least be open to that possibility as you listen to the Christian quotes in the next episode. Thank you.